when you open your eyes and look around, of course you see a world because that world exists. The question is, are you seeing it accurately? And I think all of us have an underlying assumption that our perception of the world is the world. Well, I'd like to challenge that. Have you ever wondered why your life is not turning out the way you thought it would? You probably haven't been in jail or seriously considered suicide, but it's fair to say that we all question how our lives are turning out. The stories you just saw were ripped from the pages of two very real people's lives. We're gonna hear about the events that led these people to a very, very dark place and also understand why these tragic situations were entirely preventable. Do you know what gives your life meaning? There is a vast amount of power that comes from knowing and fully understanding the answer to this question. There are two things that dictate your life experience, yet nobody seems to fully understand how they work. These two things are your perception and your emotions. Everything begins with perception. Almost all of our behaviors, all of our beliefs, our loves are all grounded in perception. Perception touches everything. It touches art, it touches beauty, it touches music. Everything you are, see, and experience is dictated by perception. Your emotions give your life the only meaning it has. Fully understanding these concepts and how they work will dramatically improve your life. There is no direct relationship between your perception of the world and accuracy. In fact, it wouldn't even be useful if we could see the world accurately because the world doesn't come with instructions. It doesn't tell us what to do. More than that, we're physically separate from that world. Is it possible to go from feeling so abandoned and alone that you're seconds away from taking your own life to feeling a deep sense of love for yourself and those around you? Yes, it is. And we will teach you how. Had these two people understood these concepts, it would have shifted their reality. Their lives would have turned out completely different. It's our hope that by sharing their stories, you will see and understand their decisions to adopt the beliefs that drove them down a dark path. So when we start thinking about perception and understanding that perception is not of reality accurately, many people feel very frightened of that. It's like, well, uh, what does that mean? If, if I'm not seeing the world as it really is, that feels very scary. But it's not that at all. It's actually empowering. Because if you're not seeing the world as it really is, if you're not seeing it accurately, it means you have possibility. Can you climb out from rock bottom, where you feel totally powerless, to a place where you actively create the life of your dreams, where you can achieve all that you want in life? we are going to prove that it is possible. Perception is defined as the way in which one views the world, but how does it work? Your perception is the one thing that dictates every opportunity you see, decision you make, and action you do or don't take. Perception plays a critical role in your life, so it's important to understand how it works. Everything you see and experience is assigned meaning based on what's happened to you in the past. We're not gonna narrate the following scene. See if you can guess what's being depicted. on her way to a job interview. Unfortunately, she was questioning her self-confidence due to some childhood experiences. I'm sure this now makes perfect sense to you, but what if I told you this was wrong? 
This was actually about this woman's struggle with her eating disorder, and she is trying to do her best to ignore the pastries on the counter. I'm sure that you can now see that this was the meaning of what was going on with the woman. But wait, what if the true narrative of the story was that this woman was struggling because she just got off the phone with her passive aggressive mother who was just berating her over the fact that she hadn't found a husband yet and if she just lost some weight, it would help her chances of finding a man. As we just clearly demonstrated, there's an infinite number of possible interpretations of any given situation. Life, just like in the story, does not come with narration, explanation, or meaning, except for the one that you give to it. Once we gave you context for what it might mean and you applied that context, it made perfect sense, until it didn't. Once you have a grasp of how perception and your emotions work, you can harness the power of these concepts to create the life that you desire. You can actually be an active participant in the narrative that you're already constructing. It's just that you can construct it with awareness. And that's what it is to be human. Who you are is necessarily a consequence of the interactions with other people, but you have agency in that. And you can have agency in how you apply meaning and value to the things that happen. And that meaning and value become part of your history that will shape what you're going to do in the future. Growing up, I had a happy, normal childhood. I had a lot of friends. I had a great Barbie collection. I had a loving mom and dad. And we had a happy family. Shortly after turning eight, all of that changed. You know, from what I remember, I had a really happy childhood. You know, my mom describes me as one of those people that lit up the room when they walked in. I wanted to go to school so bad. I would beg my mom every day, can I go to school, can I go to school? But after getting there, it became apparent that I had some pretty severe learning disabilities. I was outside one day playing with my friends and there was an older boy in the neighborhood. I believe he was in high school and I somehow got separated from my friends and that boy took me in his garage and he molested me. He told me that it was all my fault. I didn't know what sexual abuse was, but I knew that I felt awful afterwards and I knew that it was wrong inside of me. I felt all alone and scared and unsafe and I felt very dirty and I hated my body. I remember the first day I went into the special ed class, the teacher called me up in front of the room. I said, okay. And so I went up to the front of the class and she said, it's, it's time for you to go to your special ed class. And she goes, I don't know if you know this or not, but only stupid and retarded kids go to special ed. I didn't, I didn't even know what to think. I just kind of froze. The teacher told the entire class to tell me I was stupid on the way out. You know, of course, when I got home that night, I told my mom all about it. She just basically told me, look, the world's a cruel place. There's a lot of mean people out there, and you're just gonna have to learn how to deal with this and do the best you can. When we're children, we're taking anything that's fed to us as truth without any filter. And what that does to us is that says, this environment is bigger than me, and so obviously they must be right, and I must be wrong. And that belief goes deep, and it goes to the core. One day, I decided I was gonna tell my parents. My dad was in the garage and the boy showed up and I was like, oh my God, he knows I'm gonna tell, he somehow knows. I was freaking out, but really he came over to my house to see if my parents would buy some pizza for a fundraiser from him. And my dad went in the house to get his wallet to buy the pizzas from him and he threatened me. He said, don't you ever tell I will tell them, you made me do this. And so I took this into my adulthood and I never told anyone until I was an adult. 
A trauma is something that has happened to us at one point that never got processed. And so day after day, it follows us like a filter. It shows us who we are in relationship to every person and every situation that we enter into. My, my parents were divorced and my dad was off partying. He wasn't around enough to really address an issue of this magnitude. So the next day I went to school hoping, you know, that this was just a one-time occurrence. Every single day, she would tell me I was stupid and then she would make the entire class call me stupid on the way out the door. You know, what choice did I have but to believe them? There was one kid in particular that took the lead role in this. And over the next couple of years, he became my personal bully. Those memories were burnt so deeply into my subconscious mind, I'm never, ever gonna forget those people or those experiences. You have now attached who you are as a person and your very identity to that emotion. So anytime that emotion then surfaces from that moment forward, you're going to relate yourself and who you see yourself to be to that feeling as you go out and interact with other people and the situations that come into your life start to resemble those same situations that you were traumatized in, you then return to those moments as if you were that age, as if you had that mindset, and as if you had the same coping skills that you did when it formed. At the end of my kindergarten year, I made my mom call the school and pull me out of special ed. Being pulled out of special ed presented its own problems. I needed help, you know, I had pretty severe dyslexia. I mean, things like getting called on a class to read out loud were like the most torturous parts of my existence. I avoided it like the plague. I literally just slipped through the cracks all the way through school. The bullying continued. The boy, you know, continued to follow me around and continued to make fun of me. I climbed up one of those old slides, the really tall ones, eight, 10, 12 feet, I don't even remember. I just remember it was tall. And all around it was hard packed dirt. And the next thing I remember is I woke up in the hospital. There was so much damage to the left side of my face that my mom said I look like the elephant boy. You know, I found out sometime later from a friend that I was pushed off that slide. At that point, I made the choice not to tell my mom. You know, she'd already proven that she wasn't going to do anything about it anyway. And so I had to find a way to survive. When a young person is rejected, that physiological state creates a context for the shaping of the brain, such that certain meanings also get attached, where those meanings can be incredibly negative, negative about oneself, negative about the world. The meaning is, I don't matter. We know from research done, for instance, on children in orphanages, where there was no touch, there was no interaction at all. They almost completely withered. They just so need that sense of touch and existence. Shortly after my abuse, I noticed that my house seemed chaotic and my parents weren't getting along. It's probably why they didn't notice there was something wrong with me because they had their own set of issues to deal with. I couldn't stop blaming myself because I was young and I didn't know any better. They ended up getting a divorce. My dad and I were very close. I love to be with him. I love to go to work with him. After my parents got divorced, he decided he didn't want to be a dad anymore. If the one person in the world who's supposed to love you doesn't. To me, this meant I was unlovable. That was really heartbreaking to grow up knowing that your own dad didn't love you. I felt I wasn't good enough. I felt like he was just out living his life and he had no clue how alone I felt without him. When a child believes that they have been abandoned by their parent or their caregiver, the child then retracts from their family system. They retract from being able to accept love. They now believe at a core cellular level that I don't belong here. 
But once the child has accepted that as their reality, then all the love in the world won't get through to them because the emotions are clouding their judgment and they're saying, I am not good enough for whatever is being offered to me and therefore I need to stay hidden. My dad was larger than life. You know, he was like six foot four. He was loud, he was boisterous. When he walked into a room, you knew it. He commanded attention. And so here's a man I really looked up to. I mean, I just wanted to be him. But it was very hard for me to get my father's attention. Even though I saw him every once in a while, when I did see him, it was kind of like Disneyland dad type stuff. The deal was is that he was to pick me up every other weekend. So every Friday, I would call him. Dad, you coming to get me? Coming right now. I'm like, you promise? Yep, I'm on my way. I'll be there in 30 minutes. And I'd be so excited, I would go out and I would wait on the porch for him. And I would wait, and I'd wait. And then I'd run back in the house and I'd call him and I'd say, Dad, where are you? I'm waiting for you. And he'd say, I'm on my way, man. I just got caught up and I'll be there soon. And I'd go back and I would wait on the porch until the point where I'd fall asleep and my mom would have to come get me. That really, that was hard for me, you know? I felt rejected. You know, this guy should love me and he should want to spend time with me and he, and he didn't. And this wasn't something that happened once, it was something that seemed like it happened a thousand times. I have felt this overwhelming need to be accepted. I started becoming more and more angry as time went on. I started lashing out. No one in my family was giving me any attention. And I felt angry and alone. And I started to cut myself. And I had to get several stitches. I think my mother always wondered what was wrong with me, why I was such a sad soul. What's tremendously powerful is the loss of a sense of love and safety early on in life, when the brain is so remarkably plastic, so adaptable. Brain cells are constantly in a state of growth and shaping itself according to its experience of the world and the meaning of that world. And the space of possibility will be highly constrained. There will be tremendous fear the fear of loss, the fear of uncertainty. Imagine what it would be like if you were going to enter these waters, the waters of life, at a very early age when you don't even know how to swim yet. And it's a storm, there are waves. And now you're swimming, you're treading, but you're going to get exhausted if you don't have a place from which to stand to then rest, to have that sandbar. And that's what love is, to provide that sandbar for another person, a child, to come back and rest and then to swim again. And it's in the process of swimming that you become more adaptable and more resilient. After high school, I moved out the second I could, hoping for a better life. And instead, things got worse. I dated terrible men and I got into abusive relationships and I let them get away with it because that's what I thought I deserved. I was my own worst enemy. I berated myself on a daily basis. I blamed myself for everything that had ever happened to me. All of the sadness, all of the abuse, and all of the pain and anger. I started hating myself more and more. I hated my body so much, I became bulimic. Even though I was a size zero, all I could see is fat on my body. And so my world grew darker and darker and sadder and sadder as time went on. And I started to lose all hope of having any kind of happiness in my life. One of the ways that we as children try to cope with any kind of trauma is to start to berate ourselves or to tear ourselves down. But what that does is that self-hatred starts to become a really toxic influence 
that impacts every relationship that they have, that clouds their judgment of who they are. And so what that does is it turns into patterns and behaviors of self-harm or suicidal ideation or just severe addiction to depressive thoughts and patterns that keep us in our beds, that keep us from going outside, that keep us from doing anything that would make us feel better. And it sets us up for a misery that becomes a continuous feedback loop. I am miserable, so I react in miserable ways, so I get miserable feedback, and back it comes. And that continuous source of adrenaline and depression cycles through our bodies and our veins as if it's the very blood that's nourishing us, when in all reality, it's killing us. I was losing my faith in humanity. I wanted more than anything to trust people. So I continued over and over and over again to put my trust in people. And it always backfired. And the most frustrating part was I just didn't understand why. You know, when it came to work, I didn't have the skills necessary to succeed. And I would rather just not do something than to give anybody reason to think that I was stupid ever again. I started to give up hope. I started to feel like they won and I lost. That I was never going to have the life that I desired. So in order to cope with that pain, I started doing drugs. You know, at first it all starts out casual, you know, it's just a weekend thing. Cocaine became crack, and eventually I turned to heroin. You know, once or twice a week, came once or twice a day. So as time went on, I was an addict. And I got to the point where drugs became my whole life. People get into the cycle of feeling a victim and things happening to them, being the recipient of the world. Not only have they actually taken away their own agency and the ability to decrease the chance of that happening in the future, in some sense, they've actually increased the chance of suffering. So we will often create behaviors that will engender a strong response. And sometimes a negative behavior is the most powerful way to get that sense of existence. I was in another terrible relationship and I decided one day I didn't deserve this. And I packed up all my shit and I left. And I drove to a hotel. And I remember sitting on the bed for hours in the quiet. And I was thinking about whether or not I wanted to live. I felt like my whole inner world was so dark. I was alone, and no one loved me. All I could find were shitty relationships, and even my own dad was gone. I decided that day that I was gonna end my life. I was done. I was done hurting. I was done with all the pain and sadness that life caused me. So I went into the bathroom to hang myself. And I got into the shower and I tied myself up around my neck. I turned the shower on and I dropped. I could feel myself dying. And all I could see is darkness before I blocked out. <laughs> 